Welcome back to Science Rehashed, everyone. Thank you for joining us again today. Hi, Shen. Hi, Mehdi. So last episode, uh, we had COVID-19 six feet apart, and we focused on the mental health effects of the pandemic in the third installment of our COVID-360 Perspective series. It's really good to return this week with an episode of our original series, Rehashing Science. We have heard from some of our listeners that the episodes focus on coping techniques such as being appreciative for small victories or pleasures. What's something you have been enjoying recently, Shin? So... I think I've really been appreciating getting to see a few of my friends and some of the team members in Science Rehash. So yesterday we had a nice little gathering outside at the Esplanade in Boston with a number of our team members. And it was really great to see everyone, chat with everyone, catch up. It was just a lot of fun. Absolutely. It was a, it, it was a great time. Being back with the people and socializing and seeing everyone after a while. So today we have a nice immunology paper to transition us back into the world of notable scientific literature. Our guest today is Dr. Hai Chi, a professor of immunology at Tsinghua University in Beijing, China. And his paper called Brain Control of Hormonal Immune Responses Amenable to Behavioral Modulation was published in Nature these past April 2020. And we're really thrilled to have on our show today. Dr. Chi, welcome. Tell us a little bit about how you began your career. I was actually trained as a, a physician in China. Uh, that's a long time ago. From I think I, I went to medical school in 91. Then I finished in 96. Uh, it, the, the story is kind of funny that um, I was supposed to be a cardiologist, but uh, on the day that uh, uh, I was supposed to report to my hospital, uh, I, I quit it. Clinical medicine wasn't something I, I, I feel very passionate about, and I didn't know what to really, um, what, what's my passion. So so I tried graduate school. I spent a year uh, studying like a uh, TOEFL and GRE. Uh, so I, I, I went to the States uh, in 97. So I spent five or six years in University of Texas, um, Galveston, to study Lishmania parasite. Then from there, I, I, I went to do, after that, uh, to do a postdoc with Ron Germain at a NIH. Uh, that's where I, I start to study the hardcore immunology. What is the central question does your lab seek to address? We are a, a basic uh, um, immunology lab, and we are mainly interested in how um, the human immunity is being regulated in every aspect. I mean, German Center is uh, a, a center place that we are looking at. Everything that uh, about German Center we are fascinated about. Um, so, uh, and eventually, I think our research hopefully will lead us to um, uh, new ways to manipulate the system so we can uh, 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 more precisely have a um, uh, designed vaccine instead of a um, so try and error uh, way of developing vaccine. Proudly, if I can summarize, every day we encounter things that can make us sick, from bacteria to viruses to fungi. The world around us is full of pathogens. Pathogens are microorganisms that can cause disease. But thanks to our immune system, a series of defense mechanisms in our body that work 24 seven to keep us healthy. The immune system includes specialized cells, proteins such as enzymes and antibodies. It also includes part of our body you might not have thought of uh, as a part of our immune system, such as our skin. So what is the body's first line of defense against pathogen? 
Our immune system, generally speaking, has three levels of defense. If a pathogen passes through one level, the next level takes over. The first line of defense is our innate immune system. Level one of this system consists of physical barrier, like our skin. But if you cut the skin on a finger, bacteria would have a way to get into our body. At that point, the next level of our innate immune system would respond. I want to summarize the next response, which is the body's second line of defense against pathogens. It consists of cells and proteins that attack invaders. Innate defenses at this point are non-specific. In other words, no matter what pathogen our body is fighting, the same response happens and the same cells and and proteins are at work. In this line of defense, cells called the uh, phagocytes live in our tissue and the bloodstream. Macrophages and neutrophils are specific types of white blood cells that are two types of uh, phagocytes. And these phagocytes recognize when something enters our body that doesn't belong there and jump to work. They destroy the invaders using a process called phagocytosis. And macrophages also sound an alarm by producing proteins called cytokines to recruit other types of white blood cells to help. But there are some uh, situations that the innate immune system cannot handle it. For example, there might be too many bacteria or the bacteria might multiply too quickly. That's when our adaptive immune response kicks in. So what is the body's third line of defense against pathogens? That's what we're talking about, the adaptive immune response, which is consists of cells tailor-made to get rid of specific microorganisms or pathogens that have invaded our tissue. Special cells called uh, dendritic cells are the point of communication between the innate or the second line and of defense and adaptive immunity. And, and we remember the macrophage. When they sound the alarm, dendritic cells are part of the crew that responds. They travel to the site of infection, they phagocytes and break off parts of the pathogen. They carry these parts to our lymph nodes where adaptive immunity begins. And one thing that I would like also to add here, the adaptive immune response involves two main types of specialized white blood cells called lymphocytes, and they are B cells and T cells. B cells found in the blood, their main function is to mature into the cells that produce antibodies. The T cells in the lymph nodes, the dendritic cells search for T cells and our body makes millions of different T cells and each type of T cell can recognize a different type of pathogen. Usually T cells can eliminate a bacterial infection just days after they have been activated. At this point, our body can stop fighting and we will start to feel better. As I explained, our immune system is a complex system working around the clock to keep uh, us healthy. Speaking of the immune system, you have published an uh, outstanding paper a couple of months before in, in Nature, which the listeners, they can find it through our website. It's an incredible paper which you discover the brain pathway capable of controlling adaptive immunity. And you begin the paper by saying it has been speculated that brain activities might directly control adaptive immune responses in lymphoid organs, although there is little evidence for this. Okay, can you provide some of these prior contexts? What was known prior to your study? The impetus for the study, there are two parts. Um, one is actually, um, a not so scientific observation or anecdotal is that like in the 80s in China, uh, there's a very popular sort of a, uh, um, it's a combination of a mild physical exercise and a meditation or, or so-called, maybe you heard of it, it's called Qigong. There are, there are hundreds of people, they line up and they close their eye, they listen to their some instruction and they do a sort of weird move 
um, you know, sometimes I give seminars, I show this picture, it's kind of scary. You know, people get like, a, they, they look like they're, they're crazy. And they, they all report, they feel like a positive sort of a effect on their body. And I, when I was a kid, of course, at the time, I, I was uh, very suspicious because um, I am not sure. I, I, I felt that's, that's just crazy. But then I went to medical school, and um, but this this sort of an image is like a really. Can, 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 I, can I can I pause a little bit here? Shen, did this resonate with you? I've never introduced oh, yeah. to this activity before. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, I I grew up in China when I was younger, and of course, these um, they typically are older, so older ladies and older uh, men. And they would gather at the park and practice Chico, and they typically, you know, um, ha- have like their arms out a little bit in front of them as if they're hugging a tree uh, with their eyes closed. But there are specific ways you're supposed to do these moves in order to um, regulate the chi inside your your own body. So it's it's fascinating, but you see it everywhere. And when you grow up, you know, seeing this everywhere, it, it becomes normality. <laughs> and it was a it was a particularly uh, uh, popular in the eighties. Then, then I think it when it gets to the nineties, maybe people get busier. They got there's got many other things to do. With them. and also many of the icon in Qigong that turn out they are they are just like um, you know a scam. Um, there, there are many fake ones. Um, so they 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 became unpopular. Uh, nobody really do that kind of like a group Qigong session. It's a, it's a uh, but you know I even have a relative that who. who who sort of went to those sessions and, and they came back to say, um, you know, there are certain changes, you know, but of course, after medical school, after the, the, the research tra- training, we know it could be placebo effect, but, you know, placebo involved, you know, brain activity and placebo is, is still an effect on your brain. So I always had this fascination about why the brain has a more direct way of uh, influ- at least influencing the immune system beyond what we already know about the, uh, neuroendocrine system, which works through the circulation, right? So that's that's one aspect. Another aspect is you know the pioneering work from Kevin Tracy, and they were they were looking at you know they, there's a, this concept of anti-inflammatory reflex. Even though I know in the field there was a debate about in you know, the particular circuitry pathways that from the the, the vagus nerve to to uh, the macrophage in the in in, in the spleen. It's not all that clear, but there appears to be, you know, at least, you know, you stimulate the vagus nerve, you, you get an effect at, um, on the, the immune reaction. So they're clearly linked uh, somehow from the central nervous system to the ongoing immune cell function. I mean, in the, in the Kevin Tracy case, it's, it's an innate arm of the, the immune reaction. You know, even when I just started my own lab, I, um, I thought about, you know, how to address the question, you know, whether I can in the animal model, use a more rigorous a scientific investigation to ask the question whether the brain has a direct sort of link to the adaptive arm. So you found that there are specific neurons in the brain that if you stimulate them, it will um, send a signal through the splenic nerve and release uh, neurotransmitters, essentially, or, or molecules that will... That will uh, directly communicate with these immune cells, correct? And then you use optogenetics, which is a commonly used tool in neuroscience that where you inject a gene that expresses a particular receptor that is responsive to light. And then you simply shine the light on those neurons in the brain that's uh, connected to uh, the splenic nerve, and that way you can activate at your will those particular signaling to those cells. Right. So with this context in mind, could you please take us through the basic setup for these uh, for the experiments in this paper? So we were looking for behavior or thought process or in, in the meditation, right? So in humans, is that. But in, you know, in mouse, obviously, we cannot control the thought process, even if, well, well, who knows? Do they have? Um, but we can design a behavior uh, uh, paradigm. So we actually went through many behavior paradigm. Um, it turned out most of the um, um, the stress model that the neuroscientists typically use are immunosuppressive. That's very immunosuppressive indeed. 
um, because they, they activate the, the HPA axis or, or the neural endocrine system so much that it generates lots of corticoid and those are immunosuppressive. Um, so we, our reasoning was that uh, we have to have a right balance. It's, it's like our daily experience that if you, if maybe if you, if you overdo certain things, you overdo qigong, you overdo exercise, it can, it could do harm. So, and it's a, it's a, a serendipity that our, my students uh, uh, came to this uh, behavior model where you let the little mouse stand on the transparent platform raised above from the floor one and a half meter. And the mouse have a, a sort of acrophobic type of a response. And that process is sufficient to activate the type of the neurons that we know are connected to the, to the spring nerve. And every day, the mouse do this at like three minutes twice. And that's sufficient to boost the antibody response against the vaccine that we give the mouse. So it sounds like there's a causal relationship between the mouse behavioral paradigm and its immune response rather than some kind of correlation. We can use uh, um, um, a certain um, manipulation method that we can, we can ablate the neuron we can inhibit the neuron, um, then, then there's, a, there's a behavior paradigm, the original ability to stimulate the immune, um, enhance the plasma cell response will be lost if this type of neuron is not there or if the spring nerve is not there. So that, that tells us that the behavior activate a particular type of group of neurons that's going into the spring nerve to enhance the immune response. It is really a one connection. So after that, I think uh, we, we feel that we, we have a complete a pathways that where it's, it's not a meditation, but, but it is in the mouse. It's perhaps so far the most complicated sort of behavior the mouse would do that would be able to utilize a previously unknown neural pathways to enhance the immune, immune response. Dr. T, you mentioned that Having the mice stand on a transparent platform showed a positive effect on its immune response. Can you explain how this particular behavior would have that effect in mice? We only understand part of it. Let, let me explain. So not only the transparent, it's also like one half meters above the ground. And it's only 10 centimeters in diameter. So the mouse, uh, I, 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 I'm trying to think of like a, if I were a mouse, uh, this is a somewhat equivalent, like uh, I'm standing on, 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 on some like uh, 150 meters uh, above the ground, something that transparent, it's only, you know, a meter across and I'm standing there and, and there's no sort of a handle, anything. It looks uh, scary. So the mouse, uh, like I said, it has uh, this uh, acrophobic type of uh, uh, a response. You know, you, you can see certain mouse even shake. They, they they cannot they don't dare to jump and then the, but they they don't know how, how to escape that's that's the sort of visual uh, then we also measure how uh, the CRH neuron the or or the type of neuron that connect to the spring nerve is responding to this behavior it's a, as soon as you put the mouse on the platform the CRH neuron in the PV and the CA become activated they use the calcium uh, photometry. Importantly, if you use uh, the body restraint, for some reason, the CEA CRH neuron are not activated. It's actually suppressed. So we think there is a clearly the mouse in uh, both. I think both are scary, but they, they, they were, for better or worse, we don't, we humans don't have a particular way of, of describing this difference. I think eventually we have to scientifically describe a particular be behavior that will activate a certain type of neuron uh, by certain uh, intensity or frequency. And that's that's really the difference. So these two types of behavior will activate neuron in a different way. Um, and they will act, they will generate the glucocorticoid in a different way. So for example, the the, the standing, we call it EPS, uh, uh, elevated platform standing, will also trigger the release of uh, uh, a glucocorticoid from uh, um, uh, uh, yeah, the cortex, uh, the adrenal gland, but it's to a much uh, milder extent compared to a, a physical body restraint. So we think it is the lack of activation of the CRH neuron in the CA 
and even a, a suppressed a suppressed activation. If you look at the calcium curve, it's actually depressed the calcium curve. Uh, uh, not only the lack of activation, and combined with the fact that, that there are a lot of uh, you know suppressive glucocorticoid uh, hormones being uh, being released, um, that differentiate these two paradigms. Dr. Chi, what do you hope or think is the biggest takeaway for humans in this study? I, I think that that has actually a real life implications in that it's a, it, it really speaks to, I think, um, this sort of the balance or, or, or the right amount. It's like our, our, our life experience and nothing um, is like the, the, the more the better. I, like you, if, if you exercise, if you run marathon every day, it's for sure it's absolutely immunosuppressive because you, 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 your stress hormone will be so high that you you, uh, you get infected, you, you get cold. Uh, but um, you, if you have a daily exercise routine in the right amount, it probably is um, overall enhancing your health. I think. Uh, but of course, in real life, how to strike that balance and whether we can have a scientific, uh, uh, rigorous way of defining what's the right uh, uh, amount. I think that's uh, what potentially can come out of this type of study eventually, like when we move toward the human, that there are certain biomarkers that we can study um, that reflect, you know, uh, the, 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 if it's really such a simple thing is, is the stress, of the, the right amount of stress and then to your, your, your splenic immune competence uh, then, then um, or we will be able to describe that in a, in a quantitative term, um, what, where the right balance is, so people can sort of matter. That's, uh, Many scientists are currently working on the COVID vaccine, and they're having difficulty finding the correct target. Do you think your lab and the work from this paper can directly address this type of challenge? Uh, uh, yes and no. So uh, let, let me start with the no part. I, I think we are, uh, so uh, the, the general speaking, the, the, our immune system works in that way that they, they will see whatever they, they see anybody against many of the target of, say, like the COVID virus. Uh, and only uh, some of those antibodies will be useful to protect us uh, or, you know, the neutralizing antibody that can block the virus from entering the cells. Um, so the immune system didn't evolve a way to know which antibody would be able to uh, neutralize. And so, so it, it's, a, it's a challenge for our brain or the brain of the immunologist to identify those targets. There are structural-based uh, antigen design that, that, that will try to help the immune, to focus the immune system to an epitope that we know that, that will involve in this viral cell interaction. So we are not doing those, but what we are doing is to Say, like, if you generate the antibody response, uh, can that last? So there are, there are parameters that you can manipulate in your vaccine sort of a formulation, let's say adjuvant and other uh, things that you can manipulate. You can make a vaccine that can last for 20 years versus a, a vaccine that you, you, you have to get it every the other month. Uh, I think for COVID, we hopefully that get something that can last for five or 10 years with the efficacy of a certain level. I think that's... Um, uh, so we, what we can help is to, uh, uh, at least in the, so far, you know, in the animal system that we can, we can see there are certain thing, things that can last longer. There are things that don't last as longer as long, and and we uh, are uh, potentially generating very uh, predictive uh, um, biomarkers for for someone that I say that you try a vaccine and you will see. And whether your vaccine can um, have a, a higher probability of getting a long-lived uh, uh, response. So I think that's that's what we can help. We have this discussion always with, with the scientists, uh, how we can translate and apply the current studies from animals or cell culture models to humans. In other words, how good is a mouse model for studying human immune response? Mm. I think uh, 
there are there are certain immune response that the mouse is really great. Uh, um, um, and I'm happy to report uh, the antibody response seems to be is the aspect belonging to those aspects of the immune system that are highly highly conserved between the human and mouse. Uh, and uh, to the such extent, the sort of molecule that it can exchange. I think it's that reflect this arm of adaptive immune response is uh, evolutionarily important, and um, um, that's why they, they they conserved with this mechanism. So, so there's, uh, I think, uh, in terms of the target, where then we can translate into a therapeutic manipulation or or therapies, those target are. I, I find mostly uh, conserved, but but the mouse system, the mouse model, whether a particular disease model that reflect fully or partially a human disease model, I think that's what the, our experimenter or our immunologist have to find out. Um, not only uh, the mouse body or the biology is different, but also the environment. I, we used to make the joke, the mouse is so much cleaner than us. We live in a much dirtier environment. We have ongoing immune response in our lymph node and the spleen. Uh, I mean, we we just don't feel it, but it's ongoing. But our mouse facility, because of the all this uh, animal housing regulation in a controlled way, so we actually have a specific pathogen free, meaning that they are they there there are many even though deficient mice can happily survive in our animal facility. Which they would have absolutely no chance on the street. So, so that's a, that's at least a one aspect. It, it it was a pleasure learning all these things from you. It was a pleasure having you in our show, and we could we could spend hours or days discussing the, the 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 immune system and how we can learn from it for the future investigations. Thank you very much again for for being in our show. No problem. Thank you everyone for listening to another episode of Science Rehashed. Thank you to Dr. Rudy Tenzi for providing us with the music for our intro. You can find us on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter. You can also visit our website at sciencerehash.com. We would also like to thank all the members of Science Rehash who contributed their time in making Science Rehash possible. This includes our writers, Madura Lolikar and Kara Brenner, our marketing director, Carla Diavanzo, our sound editors, Tavi Pollard, Jared Warsoff, and Sophia Nastri. Our assistant, Rebecca Solison. Our creative director, Emma Brand. Our producer, Shuang Zhang. And our business development director, Vichy Lo. Our show is available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and Google Podcasts. Please subscribe and recommend our podcast to your friends. And send us your comments and feedback. Thanks for listening.